This is Hannibal here from the HannibalTV.com. And today I have an ECW original. He, he may not have had a long tenure in ECW, but he was around a lot in, in the early days. He was one of the original members of the Dudleys. None other than Chubby Dudley, a.k.a. Bay Ragney. How are you doing today, sir? Great, man. Thanks for having me, dude. No problem. You're also you're also doing podcasts to yourself now, so yeah, man. Doing <laughs> doing all types of uh, doing a show like this, but I, I started a uh, reaction channel of all ECW TV history. So it kind of brought Chubby Dudley back to life in a weird way. I was not expecting. Yeah, I've tried to do some reaction videos to modern wrestling, but it just puts me in a bad mood. So I <laughs> stop doing them. That's probably why I don't watch modern wrestling. E ECW, uh, I mean, back when you were in it, we didn't get it here in Canada. We only got the, the TNN, but you were in one of the first TNN episodes, weren't you? No. Or no, TV, I ECW TV. I, I was uh, I was gone. Um, I left again, I guess, mid to late 96. Um, so the TNN came, I guess, a couple years after that. Okay, well, we'll get your whole history down. It may have been another Dudley I'm confused with. There was a hell of a lot of you. <laughs> and we uh, did look alike for the most part. Yes, yes. And I heard you say on the Cheap Heat podcast uh, to, to Maurice that – that you had other ideas of your gimmick. And when Paul yeah. saw you, he's like another Dudley. Yeah. Yeah. So, so before we get into that, how did you get uh, interested in wrestling and were you an athlete before becoming a wrestler? <laughs> no, not at all. Um, I was, a, I was a fan of wrestling from around 1980, 81. Um, but I never thought about even, becoming a pro wrestler until my later teens. I, I, I wanted to be a rock star. I wanted to play guitar in a rock band and be like Motley Crue or um, Poison, Def Leppard, like all, all these big uh, hair bands of the 80s. And um, I was always a chubby guy. And I, um, you, never saw, you never saw fat rock stars, bottom line. It was always something you just didn't see. Meatloaf. So, Meatloaf. Okay. In, in the 40, 50 years of, of rock and roll, one guy, right? Or two, John Popper. Like, uh, out of the thousands that that we've came to uh, see. Or three, Fat Elvis, you know? But it just, um, I started thinking to myself, because I was never a person that's like, all right, I'm going to be a nine to five guy and get like a legit job and, and do this. Um, so my backup plan to music ended up becoming professional wrestling because I just started getting so hyped and into it. Um, thanks to Jim Crockett's NWA stuff, those um, shows every Saturday, I'd be glued to my TV. And at the end of every show, they would do these amazing cliffhanger angles. And I'd be on the edge of my seat, like all hyped up. Like I just watched a Rocky movie. And I was like, damn, I started thinking to myself, maybe I should go into pro wrestling. So um, around 1990, I, I said, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to do it. And I sold uh, sold my guitars, my amps, got the down payment money together to go to wrestling school. Now, did you live in the, in the Philadelphia area? I lived right outside of uh, South Philadelphia. I lived like 20 minutes from the ECW arena. And uh, actually, all of my family is right from South Philadelphia, all right around the ECW arena. Was there any wrestling in the ECW arena before ECW? No. It was a legit bingo hall. Okay. You, like, at when ECW went in there, you wouldn't even have known what that building was. It, it looked like a abandoned building. I mean, it was under I-95, and it was like a deserted part of um, town that was more like just warehouses and stuff. So I don't even know how they found it. That's uh, that's an interesting story I'd like to know because um, 
it's just a weird thing that happened where, where they ended up in that building and that building became one of the most um, important uh, buildings in wrestling history. And now they've cleaned it up and, and it looks great in there. But the outside, I was there a couple of years ago and, and it's nothing so what it looked like. Yeah. yeah, it's nothing like it's so clean now. Like it's a complete other world. It, you would any like true traces of the original ECW arena are gone except for the floor. I mean, that's about it. Yeah, but uh, go it definitely looks great inside now. Oh, yeah, it's it's permanent, awesome. uh, lighting up mm-hmm. there too. But I don't think that's the kind of type of area where your average person would want to be walking around at night by themselves still. Nah. <laughs> So, so how was the wrestling training in the school that you went to? So I ended up going to uh, the Tri-State Wrestling Alliance School, uh, which was run by Joel Goodhart. Uh, he was the promoter. And uh, my two initial uh, trainers was Larry Winters and Ron Shaw. And then um, Ron Shaw was only there for a very short time because he had like a job at night. He was like a bus driver. And his job was at night, so he just couldn't be there. So he like left the uh, wrestling altogether, and it was just Larry for a while. And then Larry ended up breaking his leg or ankle in the ring in a match, and um, he had to take a step back. And then uh, my trainers became Tony Stetson and Johnny Hotbody, and um, you know everybody else also too that was part of TWA. I mean, they were always there, and they were. Everybody was helping train each other. You know, JT Smith, Sam Mann, uh, Glenn Osborne. So all the guys, Jimmy Janetti. Jimmy Janetti is the one that truly um, is still one of my best friends today. Just I, yesterday was my birthday, and I was texting with him last night. Um, he uh, he was the one after Tri State Wrestling Alliance closed up. Uh, we um, he finished my training and got. He's the one that really pushed Todd to get me my uh, tryout match. Any big uh, celebrations for your birthday? Happy birthday to you! Thank you, thank you. Yeah, me, me and my uh, fiance, we uh, we went out, had a nice, uh, nice dinner. We went to I live here in Nashville now. We went to a Nashville Sounds baseball game, and then we went to do uh, some trivia afterwards. So we had some uh, celebrating most of the night. So not exactly the wild days of ECW anymore. But healthier and, and uh, it, it was it was pretty wild. It was pretty wild, but not as uh, not as debaucherous, or uh, if that's even a word, but not as yeah. insane. Debaucherous is a word. There you go. Yeah, that ECW, is a great uh, word actually for ECW. What's that? That's a great word to describe uh, the ECW party of rep- reputation. Dude, I'll tell you, man. That uh, <laughs> they they should do a documentary just on the Travelodge Hotel, which I, I think uh, I guess it was nicknamed, and, and Blue Meanie has a shirt of it. I have actually I have it too, uh, the Cylinder of Sin. So that's what it was, man. It's what it was. Yeah, I was uh, at a hotel near, like right beside where that used to be, uh, when I interviewed Shane Douglas. And it was just random. And when Shane came in, he's like, that was where the cylinder of sin was. So it was like hallowed <laughs> ground. It was, man. It, re- it was such a perfect place, too, because it was just, I mean, it was ECW. It was a dirty, dingy hotel. And it was right across from a great diner in South Philly. So it was perfect. And it was five minutes from the arena. <laughs> Very true. So... How long were you wrestling before you went to ECW the first time? Because I think you went there maybe twice, once, and it's yeah. Uh, so it's, it's... I I started instantly in ECW. I um, what happened was I was set to debut uh ninety February ninety two for Tri State Wrestling Alliance, um, but three weeks before that is when Joel Goodhart announced on his radio show that he closed up. So I never got a chance to wrestle for TWA. So, but I was in with everybody. Everybody knew me. I was in with everybody. So everybody was in shock. We didn't know what the hell is going to happen. What's going on now. And I, I was devastated. I really was. I, I literally, I remember sitting and crying because I was like, what, what the fuck am I going to do now? Like I have not debuted. Uh, who's going to give me a chance? Like, I, I just didn't know what was going to happen. 
and um, got a call that day that from uh, Bob Artis. Bob Artis was having a meeting with all the boys at the ice skating rink that he manages. Um, so went there. Me, actually, me and Jimmy Janetti went, and uh, Glenn Osborne was there, Rock and Rebel, JT Smith, like everybody was there. And um, they told us that um, Joel's gone, he's out, and um, there's going to be a new federation, no more Tri State Wrestling Alliance. It's going to be rebranded, restarted as ECW, Eastern Championship Wrestling. So I was like, all right, good. Like, okay. So I felt better, but Todd didn't know me. So um, Todd, who was one of the backers for Goodhart, um, was just taking the reins now. So I had to, you know, do the usual thing. Keep coming around, showing my face, introducing myself. And Todd ran as a president of a charity organization in Philadelphia for young kids. And every summer he would do like a, a special show at their summer camp. And um, that's where I had my tryout. It was me and um, my partner, HD Rider, when we were the Hell Riders against uh, Steve Richards, who we also went to wrestling school with, and um, the Delaware Dynamo. And um, yeah, after that, we were in. We uh, we passed the test, and we were on basically every ECW show from there on out, from summer of '93 or summer '92 on. For the original ECW, who were the big stars there? Uh Stetson, Hot Body, Tommy Cairo, uh, Winner, Larry Winners, Sandman. Rock and Rebel and Super Destroyers were like the top tier guys. Now, I really like Sandman. Uh, I've met him a few times, done an interview with him, and I wrestled with oh, him. Cool. Um, what are your thoughts on him? It, it's, you know, it's, it's cra- like, <laughs> I, I may, it might have been like my first night in wrestling school when I met Hack. And, uh, I think he introduced himself by saying, "Hey, uh, my I'm, I'm Sam, man. Call me Hack, and um, I'm an asshole, and I can admit that." <laughs> and I was like, "Take him!" Like, I, and he told me. And then he, also, I remember he said, "You know, I'm 29 years old, and I'm just starting in the business. You have a big jump on me. You're only 20. Um, you're starting at the perfect age." But he was always great towards me. Great guy, fun guy. Um, and it's crazy to see, especially now as I'm going back and doing this reaction channel, seeing him doing the surfer gimmick. And I always thought to myself, like, that, that's, the gimmick just didn't work. Just did not work. But I didn't ever, ever expect um, him to become what he did. And that, that's God's honest truth. But he became himself. And he became a superstar. And it's unbelievable what he became. And he's also had good success after wrestling, which surprises a lot of people. You know, I ran into him about four or five years ago before I moved to Nashville. I ran into him in a Wawa back in uh, Delaware County. We we were both from Delaware County outside of Philly. And uh, he didn't even recognize me. I was in line behind him at Wawa. And I'm like, heck? And he's looking at me. He's like... I'm like, chubby. He's like, no way. So we, we talked for like five minutes and he was saying he was going back and forth. He was living in Florida and he had a place up there and he had some, I guess some businesses or I forget what he said. Yeah. He, I know he has a bunch of businesses. Um, As far as, I mean, he openly admits that he did a lot of of drugs and would, he particularly liked when there was a cemetery nearby uh, an arena to drink and do his stuff at before his matches. Uh, is is this true or is this all folklore? Because it seems like it could be true with a guy like him. That I don't, I don't know about the cemetery part. I never heard that one. And did he seem fired up and stuff when he was? Oh like, yeah, that abs- Like he used to come in. It, it like it was funny because before that gimmick, you know, everybody we we all knew um, that he liked to drink. So when he became, that became his gimmick, 
he literally would come wheel. He had a cooler on wheels, and he would have his you know gear bag on top of the cooler, and he would come in drinking a fucking beer. Yeah, a lot of people say Steve Austin uh, took elements of his gimmick off. Oh, of the totally, yeah. totally, yeah. Because he would have seen that uh, in ECW, right? Before yeah. he went to WWE. Very interesting. So, what were the main differences of uh, the 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 prior ECW than when Todd took over? Was that before Heyman got involved? Yeah, he- Heyman didn't come in until after TV. Um, when Todd hired Gilbert, Eddie's the one that brought Paul in. Um, but it, the dif- the differences were, I mean, honestly, even from Tri State Wrestling Alliance to um, East Eastern Championship Wrestling, the initial ECW, it was night and day because Tri State Wrestling Alliance was truly like what became Extreme Championship Wrestling, and when Todd took over. The, the product became kind of watered down and he was trying to get away from that and make his own identity, which I guess, but it just wasn't working and it wasn't a good product. And it, I, I personally didn't like it. I thought it was sucked. I really did. I, I thought the shows were just not good. Like, you know, I would watch those TWA shows and they would make me pop and Todd's initial shows did not make me pop at all. Were you there when they first brought Terry Funk in? Uh, for the for those initial TV tapings, yeah, yeah. Cause I think I remember reading in, in his book. He said the first couple were really bad, and I think after the Horrible. first one, didn't they actually go on the mic? I think it may have been Terry that went on the mic and said, "Hey guys, we're we're just starting something new here. Give us a chance." Do you recall that at all? It that yeah, that kind of rings a bell. It was bad. It was horrible. It really, really was bad. We they they shot the first two set of TV tapings in a um, college in like a real high class area outside of Philadelphia. That's not like a wrestling town or a wrestling type school. Um, So it was a bad setup to begin with. And the school itself was kind of like hidden in the woods. It, it It was just a bad setup. And the the you know watching again as i'm doing this reaction channel and going back and watching all this and i've only gotten up to six episodes of, of tv so far it's just a bad product it really is and you don't see in my opinion the the person and it wasn't even eddie gilbert who i was i thought was going to come in and truly turn things around instantly but the person who i thought came in And lit a fire to the product was Paul. And Paul came in the second set of tapings. Um, Paul and Eddie were best friends. So Paul, uh, Eddie brought Paul in and Paul was being like Eddie's assistant. And, you know, then we know what happened. You know, Eddie, Eddie got fired and Paul took over. What was Eddie like in your experience? Eddie, I I was a huge Eddie Gilbert mark. Um, still to this day, I loved Eddie's career. I loved Eddie's work. I loved prior companies he was a booker in. I mean, as a person, I felt he was kind of a dick. I really did. I uh, he he was he just didn't seem um, like an approachable person you know what i mean like uh, I, I don't know if it was just i i know he was not happy with the guys he he hollered at the locker room i can't remember if it was the first set of tape, tapings or the second set and basically just told us we all sucked and you know we're on borrowed time so it, it was uh it was very eye-opening it really was because i was when when todd told me because I was helping do promotions behind the scenes. When Todd told me he hired Eddie, I was ecstatic. I, I was like, this is going to be it. This is fucking amazing. I can't wait. And then when he came in, I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> this isn't going to be good for me and, and for a lot of us other guys. So, yeah, I can imagine. So 
your first impression was that when you first met Paul then? Paul seemed actually a lot nicer and genuine than Eddie. Like Paul actually I remember Paul like going around the locker room and I think Paul like really watched you know the matches and then would say stuff afterwards and, and point things out where Eddie did not do that. And you would think that would come from Eddie who's the main booker, but uh Paul was the one that did that early on. So what led to you leaving after that first run? Uh, I just wasn't asked to come back. Okay. You know, we, we, um, I mean, we were just part of, and even again, going back and seeing these old matches, we were not, we were not ready for TV. We, we were not good enough to be on TV as well as half the locker room was just not ready for it. And, um, Eddie slowly started phasing out a lot of the local talent that was there. Um, and we were one of the first casualties, you know, we were not asked back after the second set of tapings. So we, um, when they started booking the arena shows, I was like, oh shit. I was like, I, I, I was very. I was very hurt. I was very angry. I was very bitter, um, which then in turn forced me to start my own promotion. As far as uh, the first uh, incarnation of ECW with, with Todd and the, and the younger Paul, who were some of the stars that they used other than Funk that you would have run into backstage at that time? Uh, Sno Snooker was a mainstay from day one of ECW. He was on probably every single show, and he was there – um, for those early TV era. Uh, then they brought in Don Morocco. Um, who else? Who else? Gilbert, Morocco, Funk. I think that was really it. Paul. That was really it at that point. And then I actually, like, when they started those arena shows, I stopped watching because I was so angry and hurt. I might have watched maybe just to see what the arena looked like on TV. Because I actually I showed up to the tapings just to see what was going on. And I was like, oh my God. I, I remember saying, and I think it was during the Funk Gilbert matches, they were going around. Um, this is a shithole. And this is not going to work or last because I mean they had a real small crowd, and it it was like they were like fighting like in an alleyway. You know what I mean? Like it was just so dirty and grungy inside. It was like being out in a dirty alley. <laughs> Somebody says Hawk was one of the originals too. Do you recall Hawk being there? Hawk was there. It was after I had left, but he did come in. Yeah. What was Snooka like? He was a good dude. Good dude. He was very, he was actually very quiet. Um, he used to just kind of keep to himself. Um, he would talk very, very little. Um, yeah, he was just quiet. He really was. It was funny. It, it, the thing that I, I laugh at, because I, I don't remember who said it. Somebody, it might have been like my sister or somebody who used to come to the shows. Um, Whoever said it, they said they couldn't believe in what great shape Jimmy was still in that he had muscles in his toes. They said like, you, they said you could see the muscles in his feet and toes, and they were blown away by that. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing with all of his personal issues, he's still kept in such awesome shape. Yeah, yeah. Now he, and I don't, I don't know if he was. I, I this, I don't know. I'm. I mean, I'd heard stories, but I've never saw him partying at all or anything. So, okay, so maybe he had uh, quieted down by then. If it was the right. where he was, the, he was wild. Although we did have a guy called Metal Maniac that used to travel with Jeff him from here. Yeah, and he said uh, there there were definitely some trips that they were on together where he would still uh, get a, get a little party. How's that, dude? I haven't seen that dude in twenty. 
you know, 27, 28 years. Yeah, I used to see him. He was at, he was on every show too because that was part of the package. You know, he was like Jimmy's handler. You know, if if Jimmy was booked, you had to book Jeff the Metal Maniac. He's he's living in Hawaii now, and that's interesting. Okay. I don't I don't think he ever talked about uh, that he was part of the original ECW. But yeah, that's that's interesting mm-hmm. that Jimmy had a handler that took care yeah. of it. Yeah, I actually I worked Jeff one we uh on a show at a you know community center or, or before TV, I think it was um me and my partner the Hell Riders against Metal Maniac and the Rock and Rebel I think it was. So you started promoting your own company before you went back to ECW. How was that experience? I mean. It, I loved it. I really did. I I ended up learning, you know, after a few years of doing it, um, that I was happier as a promoter and booker than I was actually doing in ring work. Um, I thought I was a much. I thought I was a much better booker too than I was a worker. Um, I uh, and a big part of learning that was when I went back to ECW. And watching Paul in action, because I learned so much from watching him and tried to really um, use him as a role model. I mean, other influences I had and people who really helped me behind the scenes early on, um, one was Joel Goodhart, who I tracked down and would call for advice. And the other was um, Jim Kettner from the ECWA in Delaware that I was working for as a singles person um, after my ECW tag team run. Did you use any stars in your company or was it basically a smaller indie fed? It was smaller indie. Actually, the very first show I did, um, we brought in before he was, it was literally, I think two weeks before he became Raven. Uh, He was, I forget what gimmick he used. I think it was, Scotty, the Scotty. Body at one point. Yeah, I think it was. Uh, I forget what we billed him as, you know, because of the legal. I think it was right after he left Vince. So oh, maybe okay. we, maybe it was Scotty Flamingo, formerly known as Johnny Polo. I forget what it was against um, Johnny Gunn, Tom Brandy. Uh, that was our main event, and then the the bottom card was all uh, local guys. A lot of the ECW guys that were also let go were now working for me. Um, and we, uh, then we had, you know, everybody was using doink. We had doink on a few shows and yeah, I, I mean, and I had even, um, talked to Paul about, you know, my promotion and to, to let him know what I was doing and that it was, you know, would I be okay to use any of the ECW talent if I felt, if I wanted to. And he said, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, just you know, consult with me first who you want to use and what you want to do, and but I never did because I knew their the prices were getting so high for the guys on the scene. Was the doink the real doink, or was it just as all the indies were doing in those days, having like random people? Yeah, it was. Um, I forget who the hell it was. There was somebody who the hell somebody had bought the freaking doink costume. And was doing it on the indies in like the Philly tri-state area. I forget who the hell it was. Yeah, that there might be more people that have done doink than yeah. any other gimmick. Yeah, there are people doing it in Canada too. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> but it was like there'd be like really fat, out of shape doinks that didn't even resemble anything like the real doink. That's that's so yeah. funny. So yeah, you ended up getting back into ECW after mm-hmm. it was getting some steam. How did yeah. that process come about? Uh, that was all from Steve Richards. Um, you know, we had remained friends, and we were very close. Um, you know, early on in our careers, and we used to hang out a lot and train a lot together. And he, uh, I was starting to hear the buzz of ECW, and especially after the whole thing with Shane throwing the belt down because I had become very good friends with Dennis Carluzzo, who was the competitor over in Jersey, competitor promoter of NWA New Jersey. So 
when that happened, you know, I, I remember Dennis calling me freaking hell out. But um, so I started watching ECW again, and then I was like, this this is freaking good. This is really freaking good. And then the Dudleys debuted, and I was like, holy shit! Like, I look like a Dudley. I could be a fucking Dudley without a doubt. And um, Richards called me that week. He said, hey, we got this new gimmick that Raven started, the Dudleys, and I uh, I think you'd be a perfect fit. I told Paul about you. Do you want to come and you know meet Paul and say? I said, absolutely, please. So um, that next weekend, I went to uh, the hotel afterwards. At that time, it was this was before the Travel Lodge. Before we invaded the Travel Lodge, they were a little high class. They were staying at the Philly Marriott, Airport Marriott. Uh, um which didn't last too long, <laughs> but I'm in the lobby and I'm talking to Richards and Paul comes walking in and sees us and immediately just says, Oh my God, another fucking Dudley. And, uh, I, Steve's like, yeah, this is uh, this is the guy I was telling you about. He said, uh, do you have a tie dye shirt? I said, no, he said, get a tie dye. He's like, what do you want your gimmick to be? And I always wanted to do, a Jimmy Garvin gimmick, and I wanted to be Beautiful Bay, and I used to have the real long hair, so I'd be like, you know, fluffing my hair up like Beautiful Bay. I'm like, how about Studley Dudley? And Paul was like, absolutely not. Get food, you're chubby Dudley, get a tie-dye, see you next week. And that's how it happened. Someone has a good question. Do you have any idea how many Dudley boys there were in total over the years? I've just seen this recently. Um, there was nine. Wow. So what? which one would you have been in order? Because I know you were before Bubba and Devon, right? Yeah. So it was the first three was Little Snot, Dudley Dudley, Big Dick. Little Snot got into a car accident like right after he debuted and was out. Um, so that's when I came in and Dances with Dudley. We started the same exact night. And then maybe not even a month or two later Bubba came in and at that point too they were planting sign guy at ringside so sign guy was in the mix too um and then it was a good maybe three to six months before Devon came in and then probably another six months at least before Spike came in oh very interesting so how long did you last? I th I think I heard you say you were there when Bubba first arrived, right? Yeah, yeah. I was there through all that. I left probably a month or so after Spike just because I was uh, I was upset. I was just pissed off. I was, um, I was never given a chance to wrestle. I was just always just thrown out at ringside to be part of the sideshow, um, which – was great for my career and hurt my career at the same time. But it, uh, you know, I got very pissed off when I saw Spike come in and he's instantly getting shots. First night, he's getting matches. Second night, matches. And I'm like, hey, what about the fat guy over here? What about me? Like, what's going on? And that's when I finally, one night, I just said, you know what? Fuck it. I'm done. Like, I'm here i i and i just I, i've not told this my my friends in the business know my close friends in the business know i have not told this in an interview and i was i was saving this for tonight so i'm going to give you the scoop hannibal another thing that pissed me off is in my second run as a dudley i was never fucking paid once so i was showing up to these shows and getting, I mean, everybody saw, you know, I was getting whacked with chairs, put through tables, getting super bombed off top ropes and not getting fucking paid, which I wasn't looking to get, you know, if they would have paid me $25 to cover my bar bill, I would have been happy. It was just the point of the respect of being paid. And at the end of the night, when everybody was getting paid, I would get a handshake and a thank you. And I thought that was, you know, so after almost a year and a half of that, and then not getting a shot, and I was like, you know what? It's not, not even, even fucking... a hot dog. 
not even a fucking hot dog. I had to pay for my own food and bring my own food gimmick. So that's why also, too, you'll see a lot of stuff where I'm not in promos and stuff like that. Because anything you see of the Dudleys from the era I was there, 95, 96, and I'm not on camera or film at ringside or in promos, because those were shot in New York. And I wasn't going to take off a day from my job and lose $200 to go on a Friday or Saturday and go drive to New York between gas and tolls and losing a day's pay for what? I was like, you know, just not worth it. So I just did the Philly, Jersey, Delaware local shows. I never did the New York shows, How awesome which I think – I, yeah, Boston, I never did none of that because I, I wasn't going to pay for that myself to, to do that and then not get paid. Um, I, and I think that was probably – and this was it, yeah, and, and it was never discussed. We never had conversations. We never discussed the pay. We never discussed matches. We never discussed that stuff. And that was another reason, too, why I left because I just – we never had these conversations. And – it just freaking, I just, uh, you know, was pissed off and hurt. Did you ever ask for money or what, no. was there ever a deal made? Like when you started showing up, when Stevie brought you in, did they say, okay, no, nothing? No. I just yeah. figured, you know, you know, like like I said, like I would watch the envelopes being divvied out at the end of the night and there was never an envelope for me, which – was you know what I mean? Like I was always paid <laughs> to to work, but th then you know I was thinking to myself like, all right, well, do I ruffle feathers? Do I cause waves? Do I look like a, a complainer and say, hey, what what about me? But then I was just like, you know what, me, I'm getting TV time, which is worth more than twenty five fifty dollars. I'm getting put in magazines constantly. I'm um, uh, the, I mean, the the perks I was getting were above and beyond um, anything that twenty five or fifty dollars they would have handed me would have did. So I, I, I ended up just saying, you know, fuck it, I'll just I'll take the perks, and you know, at some point, hopefully, it'll pay off. And it seems like it's you know twenty seven years later, and things are finally. <laughs> coming around for me so it's kind of weird yeah hopefully if you if you make money off your podcast uh you can get your pay retroactively pubert wants to know here what do you think the reason was that you weren't being paid did they just see you as a young guy and and think that oh this guy's just going to do it for free like let's just not pay him or what? you know i that's a good question i think I, I, I'll, I'll say it as a promoter because, you know, I was promoting shows myself at the same time and they were on a much bigger scale than I was. So whether you're on that big scale or little scale, you're looking to cut corners wherever possible. And I mean, I think when I, when I paid managers, if it was like 10, $15, you know what I mean? So I guess they just figured, you know, he doesn't really need to be paid. The the one I I should have approached about it though and talked to is Todd. I should have went to Todd because I had a good relationship at one time with Todd, but the Todd I felt like that I knew in 1992 and 93 was now a different Todd in 1995 and 96. Interesting. I guess what just in what way? Just a bigger ego, or yeah, yeah, yeah. he's had yeah. success. Yeah. Oh, of course, of course. He. I mean, he was. He was a mark for ECW as well. Like we all were, and and he uh, he loved what was going on, and he loved what was building, and he was becoming a household name and a star. So he he was in all his glory. And he had, you know, he had his, he had formed a clique now, too, 
of guys that he hung out and party with, like Sam Man and stuff. That you know, he had like a little click. So what was just Spike the breaking point? Like uh, yeah. you're just never gonna get paid, yeah. and you're not being used. This new little guy comes in and gets pushed. Exactly. And it was nothing against Spike. Like I really don't even know him. Um, so, and it was nothing ever personal against him. It was just, um, yeah, I because I, I I think it was I had heard they flew him in from California and were paying him. So that really you know rubbed me wrong too. I'm not getting paid. I'm like, so I live 20 minutes from the arena. They fly this fucking guy in. They got to put him up pay his expenses and pay him to work, but they couldn't pay me, you know? So yeah, that was the breaking point. Brendan wants to know, have you spoken with Paul or anyone from ECW since? Oh uh, yeah. I mean, I've talked to some of the guys. Absolutely. I have not spoken to Paul since I left and the big one, you know, with this big, st- the news story that came out the other day with the whole Taz situation, I have not spoken to Taz since the, the big phone call. Yeah. I've seen Dreamer. I've run into Dreamer uh, probably a dozen times over the years and always greeted with a big hug and, you know, conversation. And yeah, so dream- a Dreamer, yeah, I'd never a beef with Dreamer. I don't have a beef with anybody. and I-, I hope nobody has a beef with me either. I'm just, you know, at this point. I think it actually, and I've said this, I think it's all just kind of funny now. And, uh, you know, it is what it is. And I was just, uh, and I still am just very thankful and grateful. I was able to be part of that because that was a big thing that kept me there too, because I was becoming a mark for the product. And as I was sitting there at these shows, I was realizing, and I'm, I am witnessing and I am also part of wrestling history. I knew it was magic. And it's still, as we see, you know, three decades later, people still are talking nonstop about it. Yeah, for sure. And it's too bad there isn't an ECW of the modern era because originally AEW was was going to be so much different than, than WWE. Yeah. But it, en- it ends up being more in some ways – the bad side of WWE. It does yeah. have some good parts of it, but it's not that much different than WWE in, in my view of it. I honestly, I don't, I, I have not seen a full show. I've seen like when I hear a buzz on like Facebook or whatever, people talking about a match, you know, I'll, I'll check out a match here or there, but I have not watched a full show or even WWE. I haven't watched a when I left the business in 02, I really kind of turned off wrestling. I really have not watched many full shows in 20 years. You know, I probably can count on my hands. Yeah, I, I don't blame you because uh, it kind of started to go downhill uh, probably around the time WWE went public in, in 99. And then it slowly... And, uh, yeah, it's crazy because I hear like doing these interviews and all a lot lately. You know, everybody is doing these interviews. They say the same thing to me, what you're saying. But it just blows my mind because it seems like wrestling is so mainstream and huge now. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's making more money than ever. Yeah. It, it seems like other than the top stars, it's not like the 80s where like those – the whole card could pretty much get fired and go on the indies and, and pack a place. Most people couldn't name you who who's in the WWE other than the top stars. I couldn't, and yeah. I follow it other than like maybe the top 20, 15 to 20. And, and I didn't, what did they, they announced another belt. So what's their three belts now, three world champions now. Yeah. Now? That, that just, that really turns me off. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It really does it. How can you have two, now three world championships? It's, it's yeah, like, I know. It just Doesn't takes away from the other one. One's yeah. up. Yeah, that maybe UFC is going to start having two world champions in each division too. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> and there's so much crossover on the brands all the time so it's not like they're even separate brands but i see i I would love i would love to sit in on one of those meetings and and because you know 
for the most part, they have all these Hollywood script writers and all this and all these people thinking and stuff. And just where, where's the guy with the wrestling knowledge and background? And, and why doesn't he say, what the fuck are you doing? It just doesn't make sense. <laughs> like, where, Where's that person? I'd like to be that person. Yeah, and, and I'd also like to see the format change, which hasn't changed since, like, the late 90s. The show starts with, like, a 15 to 20-minute talk, like, every single show. But yeah. now there's more segments like that throughout the show. But whatever. I, I just choose not to watch it, and I'd rather watch watch the old stuff. I don't let it, uh, let it bother me. Um, but someone wants to know, the painting above your head – they're like they're not they're like i don't know like wine paintings they're not like legit paintings okay um and you you just mentioned you didn't talk to the the dudleys since I, i've talked to actually i just heard from sign guy i talked to sign guy the most um i heard from him i guess about uh, two months ago um he got me hooked up with this uh autograph trading card deal um He's, yeah, he's the one I talked to the most. I talked to Devon about four years ago. I uh, went to a comic convention when I was still living in Philly that he was appearing at to, to go see him and talk to him. We ended up talking for like an hour that day about everything, and it was a really, really good conversation. And then um, then he was a guest on my show, and he had, he did an interview with me, and we talked about everything again. So, yeah. But I haven't, I haven't talked to uh, Bubba in probably like 15 years. Maybe longer. And you mentioned uh, Taz, your heat with Taz, which you talked about on the on the cheap heat interview. That's yeah. basically you were using calling yourself uh, Chubby Dudley on your own indie promotion, and then he called you and threatened you. I guess. Well, no, it, it was not on my actual. Prom- it was. I, I think what it was is it was um, Dennis Carluzzo. So I had started as soon as I left, naturally I start getting phone calls for bookings. So I had worked some shows and then um, you know, like I said, I was very close with Dennis. Dennis said, Look, you know, I'll book you on every one of my shows. So that was and he, he was any of the ECW guys that had left, he started using. So he started booking me and he was paying me. And he was paying me fucking a hundred dollars a match. So it was I was like, okay, this is good. And he started putting me in matches. Uh, and then he put me in a match against Jason Knight, uh, former ECW guy. And um that week, you know, the the results probably hit the dirt sheets. And that week uh, is when Taz called I was working at a pizza shop during the week, and uh, Taz called me at the pizza shop and threatened me if I didn't stop doing the uh the Dudley gimmick, he was gonna come to a show and as he said, stretch me, which I always thought, like, are you gonna, you're, are you going to put me in a submission hold? Like, what what does that mean? Are you just going to come beat my ass? Or are you going to put me in a submission? Like, but, you know, again, it's like all these years later, and I've told the story so many times uh, in interviews, and it just, uh, after the Cheap Heat interview the other day, uh, it got a shit ton of press, and um, it's been tweeted out to him to Taz numerous times too and he hasn't responded um and I haven't talked to him since that day and that was in 96 97 and I I have again I have no heat I have no hard feelings towards anybody or beef with anybody I would love to just you know shake his hand give the guy a hug and I, I get it I get what he did because again as as a promoter or booker um if somebody took my gimmick that I created and left on bad terms and started doing it elsewhere, I, I'd be pissed too. So I, I would have... You might have I, a good case if it had gone to court because they didn't pay you and you did it for free. So here, so here's the thing. Dennis Carluzzo, I, I used to, and, and even during my ECW tenure, um, I used to go and meet with Dennis two, three nights a week at either the Oregon diner in South Philly across from the, uh, around the corner from the ECW arena or a diner in Jersey. And we would go sit and talk. And I used to help him with, you know, booking stuff behind the scenes for his NWA stuff. But he knew everything that was going on with me with ECW. 
And he used to holler and scream at me to sue them. And also, too, he wanted me to sue Vince after the Dudleys went there because they started putting out DVDs that I'm on. And again, I never got paid a penny. So he used to call me and holler and scream at me. You need a lawyer. You need to sue them. You can't. They, they're making money. You're on there. You're owed money. I'm like, I, I don't. I don't want to cause no problems. I'm not. I don't want to cause no heat with nobody. It's not worth it. Someone's asking, why doesn't anyone talk about Taz being a legitimate tough guy? Is it just that whole locker room situation that happened there that kind of killed the reputation? You, you know, honestly, I. I didn't even know that somebody after this whole Taz thing, somebody sent me a message saying, uh, you know, that he's not a tough guy that uh, Van Dam smacked him across the face in the locker room or something. But this was after I had left. But I, I mean, he 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 did try to come off like a tough guy. If he was legit or not, I don't know. I don't know. But he did try to portray himself with that. But which whatever, right? He carried himself that that way from from what I see. Yeah. And again, like even when I was working there as a Dudley, like I, I mean I looked up to Taz. I thought I thought he was doing a hell of a job with his gimmick. I thought he was over as fuck. And you know, for let's face it, for a guy who's five foot nothing, he he fucking did a lot. And whether if he's a true tough man or not, who gives a fuck? You know, he 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 did great things in my eyes in, in the ring and in the business. So, you know, what whatever heat he had with Van Dam Van Dam, which caused that incident, I don't know. And um I don't know. Uh here's a question. What made R V D special in your eyes? I don't know how much interaction you had with him or if he was there I, I, Yeah, no, I I with <laughs> used, to, used to hang out a lot with uh, especially with Fonzie and all afterwards at the the hotel. Um, I, R- Rob, he was like well, just one of them guys that just had it. You know what I mean? Like uh, he knew how to. He just knew how to get himself over in the ring, and he, his ring work. Let's face it, he was doing spectacular things at that time in the mid nineties that weren't being done. So, you know, he had his whole, the gimmick, the look, the, the work rate, the death defying moves and uh, a company like ECW that knows how to utilize a person with that talent and character, like a Sabu and push them to the way they could be excelled. Brendan wants to know what was the locker room like when Pillman came in and Rude, but I don't think you were there by the time Rude got there. Yeah, I wasn't there for Rude. Um, Pillman, it was interesting. It was very, it was weird. It was scary. It was <laughs> confusing. I, again, I, okay, so I was a, a huge mark for Pillman and Austin as the Hollywood Blondes. And when Pillman came in and he was doing that, I, I to this day, I don't know. I thought the guy legitimately lost his fucking mind. I thought he went batshit crazy because even if it was all a work, which it you know comes to seem like it was, something was off. I'm sorry, but something was off with Brian. And I'm just going to say you saw it in his eyes. He was off. And I don't know if it was what he was doing. You know, because I know he was having some issues, but he was fucking crazy. And there was the big uh, fight in the locker room. And this is when Pillman, he had, I, I never saw anything like this in person. I mean, he had legit like pins and rods going through his fucking leg. And him and New Jack got into a fist fight in the back. And Pillman, with that stuff going through his leg, did not back down. They were launching at each other. And the locker room, I was there in the middle of it, pulling them guys apart. And because I think Pillman called New Jack the N-word. I think it was something along that. Because I remember New Jack screaming that. Um, But that was one of the craziest things I saw backstage was 
was that whole New Jack Pillman incident. Well, of course, there must have been something off with him because he ended up dying not too long after. I don't yeah. So it's a sad situation that a lot of wrestlers fall into, but he had a long history of, of being yeah. in pain. Uh, but you mentioned New Jack. So would you you were there when New Jack and oh, Mustafa yeah. were there? Okay. Absolutely. What do you have any memories of Mustafa? Because we just interviewed him yesterday. He, he, Mustafa was just like laid back, chill dude. Just wanted to, you know, have fun. Uh, you know, he he was he was the muscle of the team, the big guy, the big muscle guy. Um but he was, he was a quiet dude, just a very quiet, chilled, laid-back dude. I, I always had fun with both of those guys. Any any other stories about New Jack to stand out to you? <laughs> uh, the, the, the big New Jack story I have, and I think this was – when this incident happened, I think this is why New Jack took to me and – I guess kind of respected me after this. Um, we were, you know, after ECW arena show one night at the, at the cylinder of sin. Um, I was probably in the room, you know, next door or a couple doors down from new Jack and new Jack was in there with a girl. And there was a, you know, there was a lot of goofy, crazy marks always like floating around, you know, the business and ECW. Um, this one guy that used to hang at the shows in the hotel, he used, to, he used to tell people he was the Sandman. Like he was a delusional freaking character. Um, but he used to call himself the Sandman. And he, of all people's fucking rooms to do this, he broke in to fucking New Jack's room while New Jack's in the middle of screwing this girl. So I start hearing all this screaming and commotion and everything. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? So I go out of my room and New Jack's out in the hallway, like fucking half naked, screaming. I'm like, what the hell's going on? And I'm almost I can swear Mustafa was there. He was hollering, this guy broke in my fucking room. How dare he? Where is this motherfucker? And the guy like ran. Well, the whole thing of the travel, the, the hotel, it, it's a cylinder, it's a circle. So he ran down the hall. Well, the idiot ran in a fucking circle, runs back into us while New Jack is screaming. New Jack's like, there he is. New Jack, New Jack grabs him and cock, cold cocks him. Dude fucking drops and he's like freaking out and he gets up and runs. So now New Jack is screaming again, this motherfucker, I'm going to kill this motherfucker. He broke in my room. The fucking idiot runs the circle the opposite way. It runs back into New Jack again. New Jack pops him again, drops the dude. The dude's like on the floor like, where the fuck am I? He gets up, runs, and notices the stairwell is there, runs down the stairwell. Well, now New Jack's like, I'm going to get this motherfucker. New Jack starts chasing him. Mustafa, me, and I think there was one other guy. We're like running to go stop New Jack from killing this guy. And then get going down, and then it finally ends up in the lobby. New Jack gets the guy, and he starts beating on him. And we pull him off, and you know, security gets involved. It was a whole fucking thing. But I think it was after that night um, when New Jack saw I was there for him and had his back that he always was good to me. Did you have any experience with Sunny when she was in ECW? She uh, she came after I did. Um, she, it, it's she's such a it's a sad story because she's a girl who had the world by the balls, but I, I knew her from very early in my before while I was still in wrestling school. You know, uh, Chris was wrestle would wrestle for TWA, and I remember seeing her at the shows in before she got into the business and um she was always bitchy and just mean towards people then she you know blew up and everything and then her her troubles over the years but um i was happy for her she looked like she cleaned herself up and was doing good and then you know she's got all this stuff but i 
I never saw her in person at ECW because I was gone, but when XPW, after ECW closed up, XPW started coming to Philly and running at the arena. And I forget, I, I got invited to the show from somebody and I was backstage and she was just, she was all fucked up on pills and was just a, a mess, a complete mess. I was like, oh my God, it was, it was embarrassing. I felt so bad for her. Well, I can confirm uh, we used her on two shows here in Canada and she was bitchy and mean throughout <laughs> the entire time. I remember after this, the second show, I had to drive her to Toronto from Montreal, which was like a five hour drive. And oh my God. That was that was after she was not she wasn't in her top shape back then either. But I yeah. remember at a hotel back when they you had to go on the internet uh, by a computer. She made me kick somebody off a computer so she could go on the internet, and I'm just like, oh, am I really gonna have to do this? Oh my god! She just didn't get, care about people, but whatever. yeah, not at all. Um, somebody wants to know who the top agent was. In ECW, like WWE had Pat Patterson for finishes. Um, I mean, Dreamer and Taz were like um, Paul's right and left hand, and then would be Raven. Somebody said, Was Francine hooking up with Tommy Dreamer when you were there? I. I had heard rumbling, like I had, it was like a, there was like a little like love triangle going on, I think, between Tommy and Francine and then Beulah and I, I, I don't actually know because I, you know, stayed out of that, but I, I had heard some rumblings, but I, I never saw anything. Were you there when the ring collapsed with Public Enemy and all the fans jumped in the ring? No. Was there any other backstage fight that you saw other than the new Jack one? Mm. I think that was the only one. Yeah, it doesn't. It seemed like the dressing room was was wild, but there wasn't that much ter- like inner turmoil, unless it was yeah, outsider, like Pillman. I mean, it was it was it was a wild dressing room, but it was a um, it was truly a dressing room of camaraderie it really was patrick wants to know any memories of mikey whipwreck mikey was a good dude he he was um he was somebody honestly like blew me away because it, it was he he just looked like this like kid fresh out of high school that shouldn't be in the ring with these guys and it was a phenomenal gimmick and was always a nice guy. And I loved, loved, loved when they had teamed him up with uh, Tajiri. I thought that stuff was amazing. A long story short wants to know if you have any memories of the Elk Elks Lodge. Uh, I never, like I said earlier, I never did or went to any of the, the shows in New York. Um, just because it, it was not financially worth it for me. What were your thoughts on the WWE's version of ECW? I, I really didn't see it, um, but I I know it wouldn't have been something like that. You, you can't go back to that. It was such a magic time between. Uh, you know, it was one of them moments when the planets were aligning, like really between, and, and it was a multiple thing. I mean, you had Paul's brain, that locker room, that building, those fans, all those were such important pieces to make it work. I don't think even if, uh, you know, they try to start an ECW again today with, you know, and just said, Paul, here, go have fun. I don't think it would work. 
Now, here's an unusual question. Chris wants to know your f- top five favorite breakfast cereals. <laughs> uh, number one is always Cocoa Pebbles, um, Fruity Pebbles, Raisin Bran, Crunch, Frosted Mini Wheats, and Cookie Crisp. Very unhealthy choices, but typical of a Dudley. Seems Great like question. That would be perfect. Uh, there should be a shoot interview with all the Dudleys reuniting, eating unhealthy breakfast cereals. <laughs> well, that's something that keeps getting asked, too. Is there ever going to be a um, Dudley reunion at one of these wrestling conventions? And I I get asked this all the time. I get hit up numerous times from promoters, you know, uh, with certain conventions. Um it was really trying to get pushed for back in December at the icons at the arena convention. Um, I was hit up by like four or five different promoters. Um, but there, there's some things there that are kind of stopping it right now. I don't want to say what it is. Were you there for the crucifixion angle with Sandman? No, you know what the crazy? I think that was the night. I I <laughs> I took a fucking booking with Dennis Caraluzzo because he kept trying to get me to come work for him, um, and that was I guess ninety five. It was early, very early on when I was at Dudley, and um, as a matter of fact, it was uh, Sa- it was Sabu against Devin Storm. Uh, Sabu, you know, when he left for a little bit, when he had some heat with Paul, he was working for Dennis. And um, I went and worked for Dennis that night, but I did my uh, Hell Rider gimmick. I didn't do a Dudley gimmick that night because I didn't want to um, get in trouble, <laughs> you know, early on. So, um, but I remember, you know, after the show hearing what happened, I was like, fuck. I missed it. I missed it. I fucking made the wrong choice. <laughs> and final question here. Who would be on your Mount Rushmore of ECW wrestlers? Ah, uh, oh, fuck. I mean, you got to go Sam, man. That's so tough. I mean, the true, in my eyes, true cornerstones are like Sandman, Sabu, um, Dreamer, Raven. Very good. And I'll throw in this last one because it's kind of funny. Why didn't you show up during the ECW invasion angle? Because I didn't get called. You know, you know what'd be funny if you had just like seen it happen the first few times and then like just entered. Random. Well, you know was you know what's funny. I I knew that was happening because I was promoting shows at the time, and I had just booked fucking Dreamer on a show. Uh, who was it? Good. I think it was. I think my main event for that show. I had just. I think it was Dreamer versus Candido. So. I remember uh, getting told, you know, this is going to be going down. And I remember watching it. And when it happened, I was fucking popping huge. I'm like, this is going to blow my show up. This is the greatest thing ever. I, this is going to be fucking huge for me. <laughs> yeah, I could imagine because everyone was talking about ECW. That really put it on the map. Yeah. Map. I'll let my, I'll let my dog, who's the mascot, make a cameo here. Oh. As, uh, as we ask you where people can follow you on social media. All right. So I actually, I started a reaction channel where I'm going through the history of ECW TV match by match from day one. Uh, it's called react and chill with Chubby Dudley. So you can go find that on YouTube. I do a new episode every three days. New, the next episode drops tomorrow. I think at noon I have it set. Um, so I do that. I'm on Facebook. You can hit me up there. Uh, I have a Chubby Dudley official page. And uh, just look for Bay Ragney. I'm all over social media. Excellent. Well, I learned a lot in this interview about the history of ECW. So thank you for 
for joining us. I appreciate it. And I'll let Thanks, you close man. this off with whatever you want to tell the fans. Thank you. Seriously. Just thank you. Like it, it still shocks and blows me away. I, I, I was a very small piece of that pie um, that anybody gives two shits or has questions or wants to have me on their show. Um, thank you. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot interviews, match videos, or news updates.